Thank you, choir, for that great message. I also want to thank our handbell ringers. They did a great job. It was wonderful to have them up there playing the handbells, and uh, it's always a cool thing to hear, so thank you, ladies, for that. Well, today we're continuing our Shared Life sermon series that we've been in for the last few weeks, looking through Paul's letter to the Philippians and seeing how Paul calls us as the church to live that shared life with each other. And the, the key to the shared life as Christians is going to be the question that I want to look at today. The question of who is Jesus? So, if you have your Bibles, I invite you to join. Spirit, any compassion and sympathy make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. And let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus." who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work. For his good pleasure. I'm sure many of you know this, but Methodists are a singing people. Christians are a singing people. When you think about some of your favorite hymns, what are the hymns that come to mind? Uh, I saw a study done one day where uh, they were looking at some people's favorite hymns in the Methodist hymnal, and the top three results were Amazing Grace, Here I Am, Lord. And How Great Thou Art. And those are all excellent hymns. Those are all wonderful. We have a lot of great ones to choose from. Uh, After church, if you want to tell me your favorite hymn, I would love to hear it. If you don't know what it is just yet, it gives you something to do during the sermon to think about it and figure out what your favorite hymn is. Now, there's also plenty of songs in our hymnal that I don't think are anybody's favorite songs. You can can flip through our hymnal and wonder, how in the world did these songs get in there? You know, were were they the spouse of somebody on the committee? I don't know how in the world some of these hymns got chosen, but they're in there. Um, There are some other great ones in there. Uh, Some of my favorite hymns are things like Victory in Jesus, To God Be the Glory, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, Standing on the Promises. All excellent hymns in the church. Now, what might interest you this morning is that the text you just heard me read contains one of the most ancient Christian hymns that we have in our possession. We know that Paul goes all the way back to the early church, and here he is quoting this very ancient Christian song beginning at verse 5, this song that sings about who Jesus Christ is. Jesus being in the form of God, becoming a servant. And giving his life for us. I like to imagine this song was written and passed around from house church to house church to house church. To answer that question of who is Jesus. That really is the question for our lives, isn't it? Who is Jesus? For instance, if Jesus is just some guy, like plenty of other figures in history, then why should we listen to him at all? I mean, we're not giving up our Sunday mornings for people like Alexander the Great or Aristotle or Socrates. By the way, I I don't think there are many hymns written to those guys that that people are singing in the world today. I might be wrong about that, but I I don't think so. There's plenty of good storytellers in history. 
There's plenty of teachers of wisdom. There's plenty of conquerors that we could devote our lives to. But yet throughout the ages, there has always been this group of people around the world who have said, we devote our lives to Christ. My question is, why? Why would they do that? Why would we do that? Why would anybody do that? Well, I believe the answer is found in the ancient Christian hymn that we heard today. The answer is because of who Jesus really is. Paul, you noticed here, he pulls back the heavenly curtain and we see Jesus for who he really is. Jesus is very much God himself. He has equality with God. He's of the same stuff as God. He's in the form of God. And y'all, that's why we listen to him. That's why we devote our lives to him, because he's God. He's not just another guy. He's not just another teacher. He's not just another storyteller out there telling us some neat tales. Jesus is God. And as God, with with all of his power, what did Jesus choose to do? Did he choose to abuse his power? That's what you see in the news all the time, right? You'll turn on the news and see some latest politician, some latest CEO abusing their power. You know, they finally work themselves up to the highest spot. The power goes to their head, and next thing I know, they're making a mess of everything. Y'all, Jesus didn't choose to abuse his power. Instead, Paul says that Jesus emptied himself. Now, that doesn't mean that Jesus stopped being God. He didn't stop being divine. Jesus was fully human and fully God. But what Jesus chose to do was to empty himself of his rights and his authority so that he could become a slave, so that he could become a servant and come into our world. He did this to fully identify with us. And then as fully God and fully man, he came to bring true life to us and to the whole world. Paul says that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That means that Jesus came into the world to go to the cross, to be raised, to be ascended into heaven as the world's true Lord and Messiah. And one day we know that every tongue will confess the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that tells me that this is not just some guy. This is not just another storyteller. He's not just another teacher. He's the Lord. He's God. And what's even better than that? This Lord loves us. Can you believe that? He could say, I don't want anything to do with those people. That sinful, wretched folk. No. He says, I love them. I want to save them. Philippi was a Roman colony, and the worldview of the Romans was all about honor and appearance, you know, the, the, the image that you broadcasted out to the world. And Jesus was something very different from how they were used to living. And Paul is calling the church here to remember that difference as they live their lives moving forward. The church is meant to look different like Jesus is different. Humility was not a highly regarded quality in the Roman world. But here comes Jesus, not grasping for equality with God, even though he had it. Instead, he came to empty himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the flesh, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So today, we have a very clear picture of who Jesus is, right? I mean, there's no way we can miss what Paul is saying here about who Jesus is. And then he writes to urge us, to urge the church to be like Christ and to share our lives together. Paul says, if there is any encouragement in Christ, I love encouragement. Don't y'all like encouragement? Nobody likes discouragement, but sometimes we face discouragement from people in life. But encouragement feels good. It feels good when somebody tells you, great job. You did a wonderful thing. That was great. I'm proud of you. Way to go. Well, I want you to hear this today. There is encouragement in Christ Jesus for you. When Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see a note of condemnation or ridicule or criticism. Be encouraged today by Jesus. Because there is love, there is mercy, there is grace in him. Are we perfect people? Not a chance. 
but he has forgiveness for us. And Jesus wants to be in that living relationship with us. That's why he came to earth. He came to make us whole and to lead us to his Father. And as his people, as his church, we then have that same love being in full accord and of one mind with each other. The model has been given to us in Christ Jesus, the model of his humility, the model of his self-giving, and that now becomes our own way of life as well. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Have you ever seen children trying to learn the concept of how to share their toys? They don't like that very much, do they? And the word on their lips is mine, mine. Sadly, some of us never grow out of that as we get older. And it shows in how childish we live. Don't live in selfishness and don't think you're better than other people. That feels like something I shouldn't have to say, but I do. I've been alive long enough, I've been in churches long enough where I know I have to say this. Because we often put ourselves first, don't we? We regard ourselves as more important than anybody else. But that's a terrible way to live, y'all. It doesn't make us any friends. It doesn't make the world around us any better at all. I love what Christian writer C.S. Lewis once said. He said, as long as you are proud, you cannot know God. He said, a proud man is always looking down on things and people And of course, as long as you're looking down, you can't see something that is above you. When we look down on other people, we're not going to be able to find God, are we? We're not going to encounter God. Because we see here that Jesus, as God, he was the complete opposite of prideful and boastful. Instead, he's humble. Paul then says, let each of you look not to your own interest but to the interest of others. That's the complete opposite of how the world works, isn't it? But Jesus is calling us to something very radical here. We are to give up being consumed with ourselves, and we are to look after the interests of others. That means that we have to constantly put ourselves in somebody else's shoes and ask, what's best for them? What's in their interest even if it doesn't align with mine. It takes a lot of courage to ask that question, doesn't it? It takes tremendous strength to be able to, to deny what we want for the better of someone else. It's easy to take, isn't it? It's easy to put ourselves first. It's easy to look out for I, me, and mine. But Jesus calls us to give up the easy way and to embrace the difficult way instead. Pastor Will Willimon recalls the very first church that he served. He was a student at Emory at the time, and he was appointed to this new church as a student pastor. So he drove out to the church on a Saturday to meet with the late leader, and he met him at this one little one-room church, then named Friendship Methodist Church. And Will said that was a lie if he ever heard a name of a church. Well, he got there a little early, began to look around before his host got there, And he was surprised to see a great big padlock and chains locking the front door tight. And when the late leader arrived, he said, well, I'm I'm glad you're here to open the lock on this door. And the late leader said, oh, that's not our lock. The sheriff put that there. He said, things got a little rough here at a meeting we had a couple of weeks ago. And folks started yelling at one another. And after the meeting, they started to take home their stuff that they had given to the church. They even started to take out the furniture that they had donated to the church. And so the sheriff came. He locked up the church and said, the new preacher can handle it, and that's you. So congratulations. Sounds like a lovely church, right? Friendship Methodist Church. Paul's word to the church in Philippi has never been more applicable, have they? We're called to have The same mind. We're united in love. We're not arguing and getting mad and and carrying off our stuff that we've given to the church when we don't get our way. We are to have the same mind among ourselves that was in Christ Jesus. We practice that same kind of self-giving love that he did. There's a a fancy theological word for this that I want to teach you this morning. The word for this is cruciformity. Can you all say that with me? 
Cruciformity. Now, I want you to, to follow that word along. Cruciformity, cruciform, crucifix, crucifixion. It reminds us of the, the self-giving love of Jesus on the cross for us. And that word reminds us that we are to be that same way in the world and in our relationships with one another. We're to live the cruciform life. I wonder how the reality of a unified church would appeal to our community around us. I wonder if that would be attractional to other people. Or do you think it would turn people away? I don't think it would turn anybody away. Do you? On the other hand, if people looked around us and they see just a bunch of infighting and nobody's happy, we're always bad-mouthing each other, and there's, there's gossip and there's bickering, we put each other down, I don't think that's going to appeal to anybody at all. Do you? Paul says in Galatians 5, the whole law was summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Biting and devouring. Sadly, that happens in the church sometimes. If you don't think so, just come to a church meeting one day. You'll, you'll see some of that. Or if you don't see it at the meeting, you'll see it at the meeting in the parking lot after the meeting is over. That's when the bickering can really start after that. But we often do that. We, we bite, we devour, we put ourselves first, and, and we're so sure that we're right. And they are the ones who are wrong. I remember seeing a Peanuts cartoon where Charlie Brown comes up to Snoopy, who is hard at work typing on his typewriter. Uh, do y'all have any dogs that can type? I don't know if Snoopy maybe is the only one who could pull this off. I don't know. Well, Charlie Brown says, I hear you're working on a new book on a new theological topic. I hope you have a good title because a title can make or break the book. And the thought bubble appears over Snoopy's head, and he says, oh, I've got an excellent title for this book. It's perfect. It's called, Has It Ever Occurred to You That You Might Be Wrong? Don't you love that? Has it ever occurred to us that we might be wrong? Has it ever occurred to us that we might be the ones in error? Maybe we don't have it all right. Maybe we need a little humility in our actions. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Who is Jesus? He's the God who's going to make us into these kind of people. He's the Lord who's going to form us into this kind of church. The kind of church where we model by our lives and our actions his self-giving love for others. There was an early church leader. His name was Tertullian. And Tertullian once remarked about the early Christian church. He looked at them and he said, see how they love each other. See how they love each other. Is that what Hawkinsville says about us? Is that what our neighbors say about us? Is that what our friends and family say about us? Well, the really good news today is that none of this is up to our own power and our own devices. If it were just up to us, we wouldn't have a good shot at living this out. But part of the process of, of working out our salvation that Paul says here is to remember that God is already working within us, enabling us to will and to work for his good pleasure. God gives us his power. I used to watch a lot of early morning cartoons when I was younger. There was nothing better than those Saturday morning cartoons. Just go plant yourself in front of the TV and watch cartoons as long as my parents would allow it. And uh, I remember watching this cartoon called He-Man. Anybody remember He-Man out there? So if there's a few uh, heads that are nodding. Now, I remember He-Man in his normal, regular form was known as Prince Adam. And Prince Adam would often face opposition from the evil villain Skeletor. Ooh, we hated Skeletor. He was, he was no good. He didn't want any part of Skeletor. And so Prince Adam, he couldn't defeat Skeletor on his own, but he could transform into He-Man by taking his sword of power and calling out, by the power of Grayskull. And then he would transform into this, like, super jack superhero He-Man. And then he would say, I have the power. Church, we have the power. 
we are energized by God working within us to love, to care for one another, to serve one another, to put others' needs ahead of our own, to deny our wants and wishes, to regard others as better than ourselves. If we can choose to live that way all the time, which I believe we can do, what an amazing witness we will be to the world. We can display God's power right here to Hawkinsville, Georgia. And I believe that people around us will start to ask the question, who are those people? Who is that Jesus they're going on about? Who is that Jesus that that forms them into a church that lives like that? And we'll be quick to answer, Jesus is the Lord. He's God. He descended down into our world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, going to the point of death, even death on a cross. Then the one who descended also ascended back into heaven. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We can say to those people around us, we love this Jesus. We live for this Jesus, and we want you to come and love him too. That's our message this morning. That's the message that we take out into the world. Jesus is Lord. He's the king, and he is truly amazing. Do y'all believe that, that he's truly amazing? And that there's nobody like him in this entire nation, world, galaxy nobody else like him in this entire universe thanks be to God let's pray father we are so thankful for your son Jesus who came into our world who who descended down to us so that he might die for us so that he might give us life and was then raised and ascended back to you And sits at your right hand as the Lord and King of all. Lord, we want to follow Jesus. We want to live for him. And we want that same kind of self-giving love to define who we are. We want that same kind of self-giving love to be our love. And to be our way of life. Here in this church and with one another. And we know that we don't have to do it on our own power. But you are already working within us transforming us from the inside out to be the people that you've called us to be. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.